Hi, I'm Rob Cos and welcome to my shop. This is the beginning of our drawer making series. We're going to go through the process and complete a drawer. We're going to do the entire thing, so you're going to see all of it, all four corners. have no idea how long it's going to take. We're going to try to do the, keep the episodes to about 20 minutes unless you tell us, no, Rob, we want them longer. Well, if say that, then we'll do it. But it's going to be done a little bit differently. So come over here. I want to show you typical drawer construction, and I'll then explain to you briefly how it's going to differ. So here's a little uh, jewel box, man's jewel box. In fact, my friend down in Australia named this a bloke box. So it's a man's jewelry box. That was Tony Martin. So the way you would do it, you build your carcass first. And your carcass must be, have parallel top and bottom and be parallel side to side. Then what you do, since particularly in this case, I'll show you what I mean. The drawer fronts are matched perfectly. So I would save my prettiest piece of wood for my drawer fronts. So I can't experiment with them. So I take a drawer back, which is usually what we call a secondary wood, and I get that drawer back to fit that opening precisely, top to bottom, side to side. And when I say precise, I mean it just fits in the hole. You actually have to push it in order to get it to go in there, and it has to be as tight at the top as it is at the bottom. If you screw up, you go get another piece of secondary wood, not a big deal. Well, once you've got that done, you then take that back as a template. You lay it on your drawer front, and with a knife, you carefully mark the uh, left and right side, and then on the shooting board, you make this piece match that piece exactly. Now, both of them are going to fit that opening. Now, I don't need to show you more than that. With, we're not going to vary that much, but here's where this, is be, this has been done a little bit different. I wanted to experiment with this case, and I wanted to make this drawer so that I did not have to worry about seasonal movement. Now, just in case you don't understand that, if you're new to this, I wouldn't expect you to know it. But if we look at this drawer, there's drawers everywhere in here, by the way. This drawer, these sides, or wood in general, is going to get thicker and thinner as it absorbs or gives off moisture. It's going to get wider and narrower, but it does not change in its length. So when you build a drawer, you have to allow for that seasonal movement. There will be times of the year where you can't do that. And there'll be times of the year when they'll be a little more loose than that is. If you don't do it, it'll bind at some point and it could actually destroy your case. You cannot stop wood from, from expanding and contracting. You can prevent it from cupping, but you can't stop it from expanding and contracting. Well, what I wanted to do, and that case is made out of plywood, so it's not going to move. So the opening is dimensionally stable, the drawer is not, so that's why you have to allow for that. I wanted to try, see if we could do something that both pieces would move at the same rate. So when we built this, all of the components, namely the drawer and the case, all of the wood is running this, the grain is running this way. That means that this opening is going to expand and contract seasonally, and there's nothing in there to, to prevent it because, again, the wood's running the same way. And this drawer is going to expand and contract seasonally. And because they're made out of the same material, it should be equal, which means I should be able to make this really close. So what I did, I took this piece of wood, and the first thing I did is I made a cut to cut off this bottom piece. Marked everything so I could keep it in order. Then I made a cut to remove this top piece. Now I had a center section left over. I took that center section, I cut here, 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 and here. Then I went in to off my shooting board and I cleaned up this surface to make it perfect, square and finished. I cleaned up, I'll use this piece as an example, I cleaned up the end of the drawer front on both sides. I did the same thing down here. Then when I glued this all back together, I put this in place, actually it belongs over here, I put this in place so that it just fit perfectly and I waxed the top corner so that it wouldn't stick but I had to glue this back together here, here, here and of course down the other end. So this opening and this piece are already the same so I don't have to go in and match the back 
to the front. In fact, I had to do this one in reverse. I had to go in and I had to make the back match the front instead of the other way around. So that's the only thing that we've done differently. It worked out great, as you see over here. When you look at this, you can hardly see where the joint line is until you open the drawer. Now, let me show you my, my big goof. This just burns my rear end. But, got to screw up once. We put, Jake and I did this the other night, and I put it together, and I said, well, that doesn't look right. Did I do that upside down? So I took it out. Actually, I won't bother, but I flipped it over. I put it back in. No, it didn't look right. And then Jake got the idea, and he went over, and he did this. And wouldn't you know, that's, I got it inside and out. That is supposed to be on the outside. And there's absolutely nothing I can do to correct it. And I've thought about everything. I've already cut into it. I've made it shorter. Can't be salvaged. I'll just have to tell that story for the rest of my life. Now, I just got to put this back in so we don't lose it. Now, I'll show you one more. I actually, I already showed you this stuff. If you've already seen this video, how we have our, our drawer stop in here. Now this drawer is, a, is this is the drawer that we're going to build. Uh, I want to do the, I'm, gonna, I'm going to actually copy the layout because I want them to be exactly the same so that when you open them up, they look, they're mirror images. The, the bottom is made out of aspen. So this is a solid piece of wood. The grain always has to run side to side. It's not going to get any longer. If we turned it around the other way, as it expands, it would push the sides out and it would jam in the opening. So because it's a large piece of wood, that, that, uh, that piece of aspen is 17 and a quarter inches wide. That could see a fair bit of seasonal movement. So what I've done, um, first of all, there's a groove on the side, side, and front. And that piece fits in there. And when I'm all ready to say, okay, I'm done with this, I will glue it along the front. Because it's close to being bottomed out on both of the sides, that will prevent any racking, so it won't move this way. It makes for a very stiff drawer. But I had to have enough room here to allow this to move out in the uh, summer when it gets humid and pull back in. And I, I put a little, uh, I can't remember the name what that washer's called, but that's sitting in there snug but not overly tight, so it'll allow that to slip underneath. So I'll show you how to lay out the back. That's for Jack in Texas. I'll show you the layout on the front. We're going to cut half blinds on the two sides. I'm going to introduce you to some new tools that you may have never have seen before, but I would never cut another half blind without them. And, I'm, and we're going to do three dovetails on the back side. Everything will come right off of the hand plane. This whole piece has been done right off the hand plane with the exception I actually had to go in and I had to sand this. I could not get this veneer top and bottom to my satisfaction with the plane. It just kept getting some tears. But the rest of it is all finished right off of the hand plane, so we're going to stay true to that. By the way, in case you don't remember, this is holly. And, of course, the dark is uh, cherry. So, make sure I don't screw up again. That's my front. I don't know, if, I, I can't remember where we left off, so I, I don't know what we've done yet. But there my, there's my front and back. These are my sides. So the first, our first step, Jake, you gotta keep me track of the time. How are we? Okay, so our first move is to go in and finish playing the inside. Finish playing the inside of the drawer fronts, a uh, drawer side, sorry. We don't have to worry about the outside. Actually, I may take it down a little bit, but that'll all be planed up in the final step when we come to the final fitting, and you'll see how that's done. Now, this inside carcass has already been completed, so that's ready to go. I, I think, did I wax the inside of there? I think I did. So that's all waxed, everything, that's all ready. Okay, now I'll kind of my, gather my thoughts here. I would prefer, to have the grain oriented so that when we are fitting this, we're planing from the front to the back. Coming this way, you always risk tearing something off of this end lap. I'd rather, you, there's a slight risk 
There's a slight risk that you're going to tear off little bits right here, but at least it's going to be at the back of the drawer, not at the front. So always try to orient your grain so that it's running that way, front to back. I got to refit that. Okay. Uh, let's go through and actually just plane the inside and that'll determine for us right away which direction we need to be going. I'm going to use my five and a half and I'm going to put an edge on this. Have we done this? I'm just assuming that all this is being seen for the first time. So I got to go through and sharpen this. And if, in case you're unfamiliar with planes, that's a five and a half jack plane. It's a little over 14 inches long. The blade is two and three eighths of an inch wide. I just removed what's called the lever cap. Now I'm separating the chip breaker or the cap iron or the back iron, whatever you want to call it. There's my blade. Now that's an IBC blade. Um, that's not the stock blade. The stock blade is great. The IBC blade is even better. We carry those in case somebody wants to upgrade their plane. And I'll tell you, I assume you want, somebody wants to know, but I'll, I'll tell you about the equipment that I use in case you get really curious and you want to buy some. So I'm using Shapton stones. In fact, I'm using the entire Shapton system. And you'll see sometimes that I use my Trend diamond plate, and other times I use the Shapton. The only difference is, well, the primary difference is the expense, but the Shapton lapping plate is flatter than the Trend diamond plate. So if you're really fussy, pardon? The bottle's no good? No, that's not the one I want. So this is my 16,000 grit. You scratch that off, you can see. This is my finishing stone, and this is a 500 grit. I usually use a thousand, but Jake likes this 500, so I'm not fighting with him. So, the first thing I'm going to do is go in here and spend a few seconds keeping this stone flat. Now, ceramic stones, unlike a diamond plate, are subject to wear. That's the way they work. As you run the tool over them, the bonding agent wears. And the abrasive or new abrasive comes to the surface. So you have to keep them flat. I keep grabbing the wrong one. Now my plane blade has a 25 degree primary bevel. It's actually probably more like 26, 27, but it's close enough. That part does not touch the work. Only the edge does. So when I set that down, I'm going to hold it like so. Four fingers out on the cutting edge so that I can distribute the pressure as uniformly as possible. I put my index finger in that hole as an indexing point. I squeeze the right thumb between the left thumb and the left index finger so that I can keep both hands working together. I have a light to moderate grip. I'm going to rest the blade on the primary bevel and then lock my wrist and my elbow, pick it up just a little bit, a few degrees, so that I'm off of the primary bevel. And I'll do these little tight circles. Notice that I have the blade like this, not like that blade's almost as wide as a stone. If you do circles like that, you're going to be going off the stone quite often. But by doing it like this, you're staying on the stone. So find your primary, raise up a few degrees, park everything. Now because these stones wear, I will slowly migrate front to back so as to even out the wear on my stone. And I would spend about 10 seconds or until I can detect a slight burr on the back side of the blade. Now that holly that I'm about to plane is really fine wood and uh, it, will sh it will turn to a mirror finish but you have to have a sharp blade to cut it. Now as soon as I can detect a slight burr on the back side of the blade and I always want to verify that it runs corner to corner then I'm going to step over here to my 16,000 and I'm going to repeat the process. The only thing I'm going to do different I'm going to elevate the blade. Instead of a few degrees, I'm going to go a few more so that only the leading edge is actually touching the stone. That's a big jump from 500 to 16,000, but when you introduce what we call a tertiary bevel, it's doable. So I'll spend about 10 seconds, and I wasn't keeping track, so I have no idea where I am, but that feels about right. Now, at this point, I'm going to Maintain my posture, but I'm going to push down harder with my index finger of my right hand for about three seconds. And then I'm going to push down harder with my pinky 
of my left hand for about three seconds, and it actually takes me more than three seconds to tell you that. But what I just did is I created a light feathering effect on the outside corners. So if you were to put a straight edge across there, hold it up like this, and be able to see it really fine, you'd notice that it just starts to drop off there, just starts to drop off there. So that when we plane a wider piece than the blade is, we can make overlapping passes without uh, feeling these, what we call plane tracks. Now my final step is to do what we call the Charlesworth ruler trick. This is a technique that was uh, invented by David Charlesworth, an acquaint a friend, friend of mine in England who's a well-known craftsman, one of, the more respect one of the most respected actually. David is an impeccable craftsman. And he developed this technique and I think it is the smartest thing I have ever learned about sharpening. By setting a steel rule on the side of the stone and laying the blade down like so, I'm elevating the blade less than a degree, but nevertheless, I'm elevating it. So instead of having to polish all of that surface only to use out here, this enables me to bypass that and simply polish a little wee narrow strip right at the edge of the blade or the back, which meets that little wee narrow strip I just did on the front. And of course, on a cutting edge, which has two surfaces, that combine to give you that cutting edge, you have to polish both equally in order to get what you're hoping will be a perfect edge. In other words, it can only be as good as the lesser of the two surfaces that make it up. Okay. Now, take my chip breaker, put that on there, pull it back, slide that over. I like to do it like this because now I have lots of control. I'm going to slide that forward until it's about a 32nd of an inch away from the edge. Lock it down, and this has to be tight because part of the adjustment of the plane blade is done through the chip breaker. So if it isn't tight, one piece will slide and not bring the other with it. Lateral adjustment lever, pivot the blade left to right so that you can get the projection even or parallel to the sole. Yoke connected to the adjuster knob, advances the blade for a heavy cut, retracts it for a light cut, and you want the blade to sit flat on the face of this thing's called the frog. So put that in there, just kind of wiggle it until you feel it seat. Now you put the lever cap on, and that needs to have enough pressure that this won't move accidentally, but not so much pressure that I can't adjust the blade. So I always verify it based on how easy or difficult a lateral adjustment lever is and that's about right. Now I'm going to flip it over and I like to do this against a light colored background. Wipe one way, you shouldn't have to ask why, and as I turn the adjuster knob in a clockwise rotation as you see it, the blade appears right here. It's a thin black line is all it looks like but I see more of it on the left side than I do on the right. That means if I was planing the edge of a board I'd be throwing it at a square with every pass. So I need to correct that. My lateral adjustment lever is designed so that I push it toward the high side, the most protruding side. And in doing that, it's going to twist, swing the blade around like that and hopefully even it out. And that looks to be close, but the blade is sticking out a lot, so I'm going to retract it by spinning the adjuster knob in an anti-clockwise rotation. Now, as it starts to disappear, it goes underneath, it goes inside here, but it's still showing on this side. So I've got to make a little more of an adjustment and then I'm going to retract it fully. Don't want to have that blade sticking out any amount because you start planing without knowing exactly how much and you may end up taking off a whole lot more or having it dig into the board. A little bit of wax, time Jake? A minute. A little bit of wax to reduce the friction. Now, I, the, the downside to holly is it, it's almost like, uh, it's almost so white it's bright, but I think I can see the grain running in this direction, and that's, that appears to be correct. And that, that is pretty flat, so I'm, gonna, I'm happy about that. Now I'm going to this, put this out of the way, and I'm going to use my bench dogs. Now, tell me if I'm, uh, if I'm being too simple, but I'm assuming that a lot of you are not familiar with hand planes or hand methods, so that's why I'm trying to cover this as, uh, as um, 
uh, what's the word I want to use? Simple, basic, whatever. Okay, blade, I assume the blade is fully retracted, so no shaving. So as I'm planing, and this is the reason why I tell people, buy this style of bench plane. Instead of this time, we have to stop and make an adjustment with your blade. This allows you to do it on the fly. So while I'm planing, I'm spinning that adjuster knob. I want to sneak up on this, and I'll keep doing it until I start to see the first bit of shaving. Now, it looks to be just a little off-center, so that tells me that this side might be a bit higher than that side. Not much, so I'm just going to make a very slight adjustment. A little more blade. Now, this board is wider than the plane, as you can see, so I'm going to have to do it in two passes. So the first pass, part of the blade will be hanging over the side, and then the next pass, the part of the blade will be hanging over the opposite side. And if you're wondering why I pull the shaving out, is because if I don't, when I drag it back like this, I risk having the shaving get pulled underneath, and then I gotta scrape it off. And when we get a full length shaving under this holly, you should be impressed because it's, it's, oh, it's such a gorgeous wood. And so bright and white. Now I still have a hiccup right back here from the thickness plane. See how white that is? I mean, there's maple that people think is, is white. And then there's white holly, and there's a piece of writing paper. Looks whiter that way. That might be cheating. Now, if you're wondering why I'm still going, I still got a little uh, snipe right there. That's an imperfection in the thickness planer. By hand tools, you can do better work. And I'm just going side to side, trying to take the same amount of material off each side so as not to alter the thickness. Still have a little bump there. Hope I don't run out of wood. Okay. Oh, feel that and then tell them. Very strange. That stuff, it's just, it almost feels like marble. Gorgeous wood. Are we out of time? Okay. So I'm just going to check and make sure. Okay, I still have lots. It's going to take a while. Enjoy the journey. Don't be anxious to see the end. I know how it goes and it turns out great. Here, you have to tell me something in the comments. What's the optimum length? And I'll, I'll let majority rule. Do you want 10 minute videos? Do you want 20 minute videos? Do you want 30 minute videos? You tell me, happy to oblige. Um, tomorrow, <laughs> more of the same. And we'll eventually get to the point where we have this wonderful drawer and it'll work just perfect and you'll uh, want to go out and shop and try it yourself. Be healthy. See you tomorrow.